bear with me a second. Hope you can all hear me. Just trying to get myself sorted. So again, just let me know if you can hear me. And obviously, if you can see me, I will um, try and get myself sorted. So I can see what's what. Where are we? There we are. Right. Just turn that down. Cool. Right, so hopefully you can all see me okay. And you can all hear me. <laughs> well, this is running out. I'll keep that there. So if you've got any questions or anything, just... Um, so just do that there. Cool. Hi Norma. Right, so yes, you can see and hear me okay. Right, well, good afternoon. And um, oh, <laughs> what's um, that? Not to be a, a too horrible session. So I hope you can hear me okay. I've got obviously someone hedge trimming in the in the back, but we'll just hopefully go through. So what are we what are we looking at today? So as you can see in the and the topic, one of the things that we often find is that our dogs lack interest in food out and about. So you, you know, dog will do anything for food in the house, in the back garden. Um, you know, see Bliss over there kind of being interesting. There's a lot of <laughs> little white flies sort of flying about. But often once you go out into um, the fields and into the woods, all of a sudden, their interest is just diminished from um, from you and from food. And that's generally what we, we sort of look at is when we talk about saliency. So the value that a dog places on something becomes more important to the dog. So it's the same for recall. You know, if the dog values running around and playing with other dogs more than um, coming back to you and being engaged with you, they're never going to come back because th there's a mismatch. And I've deliberately got myself some notes because when I was reviewing this topic, <laughs> I was like, this is such a massive area to, to sort of focus on. And there's so much to, to talk about that it may need to sort of cross over. Because I'm going to cram quite a lot in and I'll try and give you some pointers to some other things. So there's things on my YouTube channel that you can go and check out as well. So in terms of um, when we talk about sort of saliency, so what's more valuable? Is chasing the bird more valuable? Is chasing the squirrel more valuable? Is running after a dog with a ball more valuable than returning for that piece of food? And I'm sure you've all come across it where you've had a piece of food and Bliss is quite food motivated because I've done a lot of work with this with Bliss. So Bliss. So I can throw food about for Bliss and she's still quite interested. So I pay a lot of value into this. And this is only her ordinary kibble and her breakfast and her dinner. And I've said this many a time before. Yes, it's easy for me. I carry this around with me, but throughout the day I'll be doing various things. So I've saved a lot of her food to do this specifically so she can get some enjoyment and focus on the food. Whereas a lot of the times you'll hold a piece of food like this and the dog's head will just go and dart around and want to sort of look away from from the piece of food and be focused on that so that they lose value good girl okay so what we're going to try and do is show you how you can sort of work through that and transfer some of the value from certain objects but you also have to think that there is an arousal curve for a dog and again without getting too geeky the dog will naturally sort of start off calm work up to high arousal or higher arousal and then there is a point when that arousal is either too much and they lose focus or it's at peak performance where they'll do everything for that arousal so that's what we've got to look at that's what we've got to try and do so we need them to not fall off the cliff and go down the other side so think about an agility dog you want an agility dog to be at that peak arousal performance a calm agility dog won't run a fast time you know they get to the start line they're all chilled they'll be slow so you need to arouse them up to get them to perform but if that arousal that value is mismatched then you're not going to get that. So I say if they see another dog in the distance and playing with another dog is more valuable than this piece of food, they're never going to focus on the food. So what do we do first of all? 
you've got to think about the routine that you're creating and changing that up and, and altering what your dog predicts is going to happen. So again, just excuse me as my sniffles start and someone's trimming the hedge. So as you can imagine, <laughs> my hay fever starts to kick in. So apologies. <laughs> so what do we want to do? And let's see who's on. Okay, so we've got, um, we have Colin and, and Freya, nice to see you all. So there's a lot of stuff um, sort of to think about before we even get to the park. You know, we have to sort of focus on um, lowering the arousal where we can and then changing the behavior so we can move them onto food. Okay, so what I'm gonna try and show you is how we, we can go through that process. So the routine, try and change it. Try and do things differently. If putting your shoes on gets the dogs aroused, put your shoes on, don't go out. You know, um, walk to the door, don't go out. Mix it up, change it around, do lots of different things so that the stimulus level of your dog is being kept lower because all they're doing when you keep taking them out and keep taking them to the park and they keep seeing a dog with a ball and chasing after it or they keep barking and lunging towards another dog is they're just rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing that behavior and it's gonna continue and it becomes self-rewarding, okay? So you don't need to be part of the reward mechanism for, for that dog. They will get things like, um, again, I'm trying not to get too geeky on this. They will get dopamine releases that reward them. They will get an action that rewards them. So if they bark and lunge at a dog to start to go away, that dog generally in the park will eventually go away. So that will reward your dog for doing a behavior that tells the dog to go away. So we want to move the dog onto food so several ways we can do that first and foremost so think about what is your dog's um, value so bliss loves this toy don't you blissy not so much <laughs> good girl so if she values this, you know, how do I get value on food from this? So one of the ways that we can do that is if I have this toy, I can have this toy here. I can give her some food, let her eat, go get it. <laughs> and probably not, the, <laughs> as you can see, Bliss, go get it. Bliss likes food. So we, we've mixed up a lot of reward mechanisms for her. But what I will do is, we'll do this with the ball. So, so Bliss likes a ball, we'll do it with a ball. Good girl. So she's ready to run again, but what I can do now is I can then introduce the food. So she's looking, Bliss. So I can give Bliss a piece of food, let her eat it, throw the ball. Okay, good girl. So I can pre present the food, throw the ball. Okay, so here I can just start pairing food with the value of the ball. So if your dog values ball more than food, what we're doing here oh, oh, is we're trying to pair the valuable ball come here so she comes for the food taking the food releases the ball so all we're doing there is we're pairing food with ball and what you have to remember with transferring the value is that it does transfer quite easily so if she values this ball you can transfer this to multiple objects but there's a lot of things that will transfer with it so if they are hyper for a ball you could start transferring the hyperness with the ball to the food as well. So again, just be very sort of mindful of what you can do. So then once you've, you, once you've got this kind of pairing going, then we can start taking away the high stimulus item and start changing down and start going for a more sort of calming behavior and switching your dog from high arousal to low arousal much easier. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the dog to think in an arousal situation about choosing a different behavior. So again, you will just have the ball. 
present the food, release the ball. So now the food is becoming part of the mechanism for the ball. And that way, if the ball is high value, but food, the dog isn't interested in food, but your dog's running after another dog with a ball, this food can become your predictor of the ball. Okay? So does that make sense to everyone? Just have a quick check, make sure. So I'm hoping that's just a very simple sort of little, little trick over transfer value. So another example would be a dog that loves tea towels. Okay. So what I did with um, tea towels is I will use one of my favorite toys and one of Bliss's favorite is um, a tail whip. And I will just attach the tea towel to it. See, so Bliss likes this, don't you Gilly? So you can see how she's got a drive and desire for it. Um, I don't mind that, but because I wanted to have that interest in the toy, wanted to have the interest in, in getting to it. But if it was a tea towel, I would attach the tea towel to this and not the tug toy. Okay, out. And then I would play with this with an old tea towel on it. And I would be whizzing it around, letting her chase it and catch it with the tea towel on. Okay, and then what I will do is once she's happy playing the game, chasing the tea towel on here, I will then add out something like the sheepskin toy and I'll have the tea towel and the sheepskin toy on at the same time. And then I will whiz it around again. <laughs> okay. So again, remember, this is a replacement for the walk that's giving you the stress. So if the stress is they're reacting to other dogs, this means you're changing the routine and you're introducing something of equal arousal to the stimulus to the dogs but you're doing this at home so that you can then transition from high arousal to low arousal which would give you a better chance of doing it when you're out on a walk eventually so this is all about a process and shaping the concept of going from arousal to calmness okay so you'll hopefully see the journey in a second out and then once they've mastered it with the tea towel and the sheepskin tug toy or whatever toy you want to put on the end you then start trimming down the tea towel okay so the tea towel will get shorter and shorter and shorter until there is no tea towel on and they are just chasing the sheepskin toy that is how you transition a dog onto a more appropriate toy so you can do that with a handheld toy you can do that with something like this but that's taking the value of the tea towel and then pairing it with something else and then mixing it onto something um, that's more appropriate for you. <laughs> Good girl. Out. So once we've got that, as you can see that Bliss is really kind of stimulated for this. She's really interested in it. So the next step is once we've got that, I still want some drive and desire to it and I don't want to take the fun out of that. But I do want to create some impulse control <laughs> so with impulse control what we're going to do we're going to have a sit yes good girl and again I can reward her with food because now I'm bringing food paired with this as well good girl and she's waiting and then I can start to move it a little bit and she's still got to wait. Okay. And then I can move it a bit more. I mean, Bliss can do this. So obviously we've done this work, but as you can see, she wants to go, but I can. Okay, go. And then release her. Okay. So you can see now, how we've taken that high arousal and that stimulus and she's now thinking in an aroused state. And this is really important for dogs that are reactive or excitable on the lead when they see other dogs or they see other dogs with other balls. The ability to think in arousal is tough for a dog. So you have to train thinking in arousal, okay? So I had a conversation with somebody earlier today. Out, good girl, just check. So everyone's still with me so far? Cool. Yes, transferring value. Yes, Freya, absolutely. It's a really important skill. So I just want, I had a chat with somebody earlier and I said, 
the, what they had a problem was, so with a ball, when they were throwing the ball, so they could say sit, wait, and then throw the ball. Now Bliss has a good weight, so she's stopped. Okay, go, go get it. But their dog was immediately running off. And I said to them, what's happened is that when you think about it, when we first play with the ball, what do we do? We get the ball, dog's in front of us, we throw it. We get the ball, dog's in front of us, throw it. The dog runs, gets the ball, may bring it back. But effectively what we've trained the dog to do is to go run after the ball on the throw. There's no command. So whenever we start looking at balls in particular, and you, if you want to have that impulse control, the best way to start is to have the dog in front of you, have them sat, and then pop the ball down. If they go to it, cover it over. You can do this with food as well. Just cover it over when they move back, take it away. Go get it. Good girl. And then I can throw it. Okay, so I'm now using it you know, a mixture, but I can actually then start again bringing food in. So if you've got a dog that loves the ball, you can bring food in as part of that mechanism. So Blissy. Good girl. Toy down. Good girl. Okay, go. Get it. Good girl. And then throw. Now, the real skill of this, which is kind of tough, hopefully you can see me okay over here. I'm just going to check where my camera goes to so I can show you this. Okay. Brilliant. So, what we want is eventually, we want to be able to build the dog to be able to not run after it until we release them. But it is the movement of the ball, so the ball rolling, the ball moving, that stimulates you know, their chase-grab sequence. So part of that... Um, predation motion, predatory motor pattern, they love to chase grab. So to try and get them to stop is really difficult, especially when we've trained them from being a pup, that when we throw the ball, it means chase after it. So with Bliss, what I can do is I can go, right, let's just get this into the right way. So if I do it this way, so I can sit. So now we've got the ball there, she's leaving it, and I can have the food, again, part of the sequence, and I can then start to roll it. Yes, good girl. Okay, get it. Oh, haven't finished eating. Ready, get the ball. Yes, good girl. Go get it. And then throw it as the reward as well. So now we we'll, we'll start to get multiple reward sequences. So the reward is the, the ball throw. Where is it, please? Find it. Good girl. Good girl. And then we can get better at going. <laughs> oh, good girl. Okay, get it. Yes. Good girly. Good girl. So you can see there that we we start using the value of the item that they're stimulated on. Now with dogs can be a little bit more difficult because the closer you get, the more the stimulus gets, but we do this without it being a dog so that the dog's brain, um, because this is a stimulating item, a dog's a stimulating item, um, the tug toy can be a stimulating item. So all three of them are stimulating items. We're teaching concept in stimulus. So doesn't have to be a dog to start with. The brain gets used to the fact that there is something that's stimulating me, but I can actually think about what I need to do. And it will be much easier than when you go to a park to get the dog to switch off and refocus on you. So hoping that makes sense. And um, um, Helena, if, if, if you're on, um, I hope that kind of just explained how you can, you can move through. Because then what we want to be able to do is almost to go, don't know whether Bliss will do it, I'm going to probably... So if I now go, Bliss, Bliss, yes, good girl, go get it. So you see there, the movement she wanted to go, but I called her and brought her back. Good girl. Bliss. Oh, <laughs> happened to hit the thing. Oh, okay. So she's come back, she's left it. Go get it. I thought she was going to get that because it bounced off the stone. So we'll bring it again. 
I'll try and throw it a bit further away that way so we can hopefully see. Ready? Go get it. Bliss. Bliss. Yes, good girl. Okay, go get it. So you can see, trying to call her off an item. You got it. Good girl. What a good girl. Bliss. Yes, good girl. Okay, go. Let go find that. Okay. So you can see, go get it. Good girl. So you can see there that that's now building that sort of stop and recall away from a stimulating thing. Okay. So that's how you build it. So it has to be sort of, you know, start it here. We can do it with food as well, just to, to show you with, with food. So she can see that. So I've got the food in my hand. And if you notice, I'm not really asking her for a set and I'm not saying wait. And this is the difference in terms of the dog making the choice and making the decision. I can add the words when she's consistently doing it. So at the moment, if she sits, put the food down. There's a pile of food. What a good girl. I don't know whether she'll do this. So if she was going to go towards it, I would have covered it over. This way. Good girl. Bliss. Blissy. She's had it all. <laughs> so she was going to get it, but you see the point of trying to sort of get her away from it. So again, we can just try that again. And this time I'm going to wait. Come on then. Good girl. Go on then. Go get it. So you see that I've checked it out, made a decision to come past. You will win some and lose some at that point, obviously. If you lose, yeah, just laugh it off, they get it. But if, if you've gone too fast too soon, you rein it back in, you make it a little bit easier. But the key for me would be, you pop the food down. So Bliss, pop the food down. If she was to move towards it, so as I start sort of fiddling and throwing the food around, if she was to move towards it, I wouldn't necessarily say anything. My hand would just go over and cover and I would wait for it to step back. So if she goes near it, it covers and then it uncovers. And then I can start to say there's food and I can oh, good girl. Go get it. Go get it. <laughs> She's going. So you can see what's more interesting. Bliss, go get it. Good girl. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Good girl. Okay, now I want the food. So you can see with Bliss, she's, she's toy and food motivated, but we played a lot of these games to put value into the food as part of the reward mechanism. I'm trying to think. So now what we can do then is we've got the toy and we can have food. So you can then start to see what bits have more value. If I put food, leave. Thank you. Ready? Get it. Go on then. So you can see how close she is to that food. So this is when you can work out what is the most valuable thing for your dog. So again, to make the food in this case, bliss. Good girl. Come here. So I can pop some food down. Now she knows I've got this toy, but what I can do is then so say, Bliss, go get it. I her eat the food. Yes, good girl. Get it, get it, get it. Now, one of the questions you get asked with sort of food eating and then exercise with this particular we're only feeding very small amounts so obviously you know normally we sort of say if you're feeding a big meal so if you are still using a bowl then you wouldn't be doing this type of exercise you can only do this with you know small bits of food so the stomach isn't heavy and of course when they're eating one piece of kibble 
they're not taking in massive gulps of air. Um, so anyone who's got any sort of questions about sort of GSV and bloat and what have you, um, using very, very small pieces of food followed by a bit, you know, you are not um, putting your dog um, at risk. But if you are so worried, then obviously if you've got a dog that like a, a Doberman or something like that, um, but I say small amounts of food um, are not going to be taking in huge amounts of air because it's when they sort of grab those mouthfuls and really snaffle it down quick and then you go for, for exercise after. But if you're, if you're concerned, obviously you just use common sense, um, which means that you take it so much slower. So just make sure. Anyone got any questions? Um, just have a quick check on there. So it's hard with that one because it sort of runs slightly behind. So obviously then the next step when we start looking at sort of disengagement, um, one of the things that you need to start shaping disengagement is a long line, obviously. So with a long line, what do we do? We just pop this. Lissy, come here. We would pop the dog on a lead. And the start of this would be popping some food down. So I'm just going to hold her away from it. So there's some food there. I'm just going to make sure she can't get to it. All right, Bliss, go on then. Go on. So she can't get to it, but you can see as soon as that, she comes back to me. Good girl. Okay, go get it. And then she's allowed to eat the food. So this is the first step of disengagement. It's about making that decision for her to come back. Now with Bliss, obviously what I can do is have her off lead. I can bring her here and go right middle. Okay, wait. And then I can add the weight and then I can pop the food Oops. down here. And the idea is, <laughs> famous last words, so Bliss, oh, she's looking at the pigeon. Good girl. Okay, ready? Go get it. Bliss. Yes, what a good girly. Come on then, go get it. Okay, so I'm sending her to an item. Now for you, that might be a little bit too far this stage and particularly off lead. You can do it on lead. So, but when you're doing it on lead, don't immediately go into restricting. Okay, let them just go and get it. You know, let them go and get it. We're looking for a decision, okay? So one of the things I can use sometimes is a crate, okay? So what I do here is, Bliss, middle, Lissy, thank you. Good girl, wait there. Again, just get some of the food. Pop it inside. Just close it. Okay, go. Okay, go. So she knows this food in there. She's going to mooch around and she's made a decision to come back. Now, for your dogs, that may take them. They may mooch around it. They may pour at it. They may try and get in. You just wait. You just wait and wait. Go get it. Good girl. And then when they make the decision to come back, you can then open it and let them go and get the food. Okay. So they get two rewards. They get the reward for coming back to you and then they get the food anyway. So you can see now we're building some real value in the dog returning to you in the face of stimuli. So if this was on the lead, it gets them to switch off from whatever it is that they're staring at. So whether that's a cat on a fence, a dog, it gives them the ability to be stimulated, but go, I need to come back to, to mum and dad. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So just let me know if that makes sense. Hoping it does. Bear with me. That's one thing with hay fever, we get a sore throat at the moment. So then I can increase the value. So I could go, okay, oh, what we got. So then we have another toy. So Bliss, come here. 
Okay, wait. I put the toy in there. And again, I can have the door closed at this stage. Ready, Bliss? Go get it. Yes, good girl. Again, now give her some food here. And then, good girl. Ooh, let her get it. Yay, good girl. Good girly. And then we can have a bit of a play, okay? Because she switched off from it. Good girl. Good girl. Ready? Good girl. Get it. Switch. Good girl. Switch. Good girl. Switch. Good girl. Good girl. Switch. Switch. Good girl. So again, now we can do the same thing where we can use the toy and see whether we can get the dog to switch off from the toy. Listen. Right, girl. Okay. So, don't know which one to pop in first, so I think I'll pop the tennis ball in. Ready, go get it. Blissey! Yes, good girl. Go get it. This one, go get it. Good girl. Good girl. Go get it. Yes, good girl. Good girl. Good girl. So you can see how just by mixing it up, we're getting the dog to think in an aroused state. And that's why this becomes sort of so important. Now, once we've got all this arousal, and we've got a transfer from toys and we've started introducing food as a pairing mechanism, we can then start going into a little bit of calmness, okay? And mixing from calmness to sort of a more, careful that's gonna go down that hole, there you go. So if we just move this out of the way. So now, excuse me. So just double check, anyone got any questions? Brilliant, okay. But please feel free, if you've got any questions, just pop them in. I'm not making any sense because my brain goes off on tangents, so I get way, way a little bit, so apologies. So now what we've got is we've got um, calming bed. Got the tennis ball, good girl. What a good girl. Got the high arousal toy. So now I'm all about switching between high arousal, low arousal. So you can see we've gone from the dog walk and that being a stressful thing because your dog pulls and lunges at other dogs or it runs over and goes and plays with other dogs or if they've got a ball, it just chases them and won't leave them alone. Good girl. Like that, like that decision, okay? Um, or children with ice cream or family having a picnic and your dog just runs over. One of the reasons why I started doing this <laughs> with Rebel is for those of you that know Rebel, know that he is an absolute food beast. Um, Bliss is probably, I've, I've spent so much time with Bliss having multiple value. So I've tried to go um, food, toy, um, oops, excuse me, just make sure I'm, oops, there we go losing the will to live at the moment sorry my phone's just so i make sure i can see any comments cool brilliant back on um that he would just if someone was having a picnic you know he'd be gone you know if you saw a chop with an ice cream and you're like he can't have that he can't have walking through a park so i started my journey and in, in terms of disengagement and this was the thing that worked well and if you see the video that's on the event you'll see um, he put in a bit of chorizo down the bottom of the garden and Rebel, I can send him to it and he gets like an inch away from the chorizo and he'll turn away. And that means he'll turn away from everything. So here we've got like Bliss on a boundary and she does know the boundary game. So this, this is kind of hot zone, place, boundary, 
um, whichever way you want to call it, but it's just a place for the dog to be. I can drip feed, I can use variable reward ratio, um, just so she knows it's a good place to be. Also, it gives me that impulse control that she remains on there. Ready? Get it! So I can, you know, <laughs> so a short burst, whoop, nearly into the bush, let her catch it. Bit of a little bit of tug, not too long, okay? So at this stage, not gonna do it. The longer you play it for, the more arousal they get. So nice short section. So out. Good girl. Now you can see I didn't even sort of ask her to do that. And that's because we've done this enough now. I can add, and I have got a hop it up command. So Bliss, come here, come here. Good girl, hop it up. So I can cue her to go on, but I'm always looking for the dog to make that decision because that's really the key. Because you can, you can see how much she likes this, but she's holding herself on there. So you can see that if you were to able to get to this stage with something like this, I'm not saying that it's immediately gonna work with those dogs in the park or whatever, but by doing it then with the long line and giving yourself some management and control, because you've taught the dog the concept of this, it's much easier for them to learn. They will not go straight into it when you go to a park. So yes, I have taken all this equipment with me to a degree. I mean, I've with the bed, I didn't necessarily take the bed. I took a towel that I had placed on the bed and I took Bliss to the park with a towel and had the towel rolled out on the floor and we did this in the park. And then when there were other dogs about, we did the same again, that she had to stay on the boundary. So I, when I go to places, I will then change up and take everything with me to build it in those new places. Because once you go to a new place, but you can see, you know, get it. Good girl. So again, we can have a little bit of a play, let her parade a little bit. Um, and again, if I'm building value in something like this, it doesn't mean I have to carry this awkward, but I could take a handheld one. So I could take a handheld tug toy and use that. But if I know I can switch her from high arousal to low arousal off a tug toy, oh, good girl, then it's much easier. So whatever I need to use to switch her off from the dog, I can then switch her down into a more calming activity, which then gives me more control when I'm out in the park and that dog is bounding up to her and I can keep her focused, okay? Um, so hopefully that sort of makes sense and how we transfer value. So again, just a quick sort of recap from where we go to and from. So it's almost show her the item, but give her the food. Ready, get it, go get it. She's going, no, I want this one. Do you want this one? Yeah, she's more bothered by that. So what I can do is again, um, show her the food, go get it, release the toy. So all that's happening here is everything to do with the reward mechanism becomes a secondary reinforcer. So now we're pairing that food with this. So we're making, remember I said about predictors and the routine? So what's happening now is that food becomes a predictor of this. And the great thing is that one of the questions you could ask is, does this mean you always need to take the sheepskin toy out? No, is the very short answer. Out. You will at some point always have to bring this out, keep the pair going. But if you put it onto variable reward ratio, okay? Um, variable reward ratio is the most resistant to extinction. So what I mean by that is if you never reward or never pair again, eventually it could, it could disappear. The link could disappear. Liz, hop it up. So you can see now she's getting stimulated. So this is when we have to sort of look at whether she can go back to thinking in arousal. So I would pair and then I could release. But over time, so week one, yeah, I might pair and release quite a lot. So I might every single time, pair, release the toy. After week one, I might go to, okay, she's on there. 
I've got the toy, she gets a reward, nothing happens. Okay, or I ask for a behavior, so middle. So we do a behavior. Hop it up. Good girl. And then the next time I could go, food reward. Okay, get it. And then the toy, okay? And then I might wait three successful occasions. Four, five, one. So I'm gonna ping pong it around so she never knows when the sheepskin toy is coming or not. That maintains the interest in the food because she's predicting the toy could come. So the toy has to come at some point, but once you've done this enough, I mean, oh, you could wait a hundred successful times and that one out of a hundred occasion, you know, is still enough to maintain the interest. And I can tell you, you've probably heard me talk about this before, I love chocolate brownies. <laughs> You know, if you tempt me with a chocolate brownie a hundred times, but I only get one on the hundred and first, I'll still be interested. <laughs> you know, hence, you know, it, it's just the salience that goes there. But this is about pairing that value. Okay, so. Hoping that all makes sense. So the, the disengagement wise, I mean, anyone who's interested, obviously I have a mini disengagement guide that, guide that sort of delves deeper into this. So it goes through the crate, all those processes to get a dog really disengaging away. But for me, this is about ditch the walks for a bit, build that value, build that intensity and in being able to get a dog. I mean, there you go, look at Bliss now. Hopefully you can see that okay. I mean, you know, she's panting, tongue's hanging out. I mean, she's not even like that after an hour's walk, okay? But would you say she's had fun? So, you know, if I was to ask you, anyone who's watching, now, is Bliss enjoying herself? Is Bliss having a terrible time? Is she missing out on not going for a walk? Is she learning a valuable skill? They're the questions you need to ask yourself. Um, we often get locked into this um, criteria of um, must go for a walk, when actually for the dog, it may not be the best thing. Walks are an important part of a cycle. <laughs> yes, cheeky, but they're not the only. Thing. I mean, you know, obviously here, got a bit of a doggy heaven here. So I've said many a time with what I do with Bliss, you know, she loves scent work. 10 minutes of scent work for Bliss. I mean, she'll be asleep. When I take her back in in a second and bring the other dogs out for a play, she's going to be asleep. Okay. So this is more engaging and this is more fun. And it's taxing her brain as well as her sort of physicality. But it's teaching impulse control. It's teaching that kind of thinking when she's aroused. Because as you can see now, if I sort of play with a toy, so she's sort of broke off, Bliss, hop it up, hop it up. But if she makes a mistake, I don't get too stressed by it. I just kind of stop, reset her back. Okay, go. And then we can bring her around. We can have a bit more arousal. And then the key is I might not even let her catch it. I might just bring this up here. Bliss, legs. Legs, come. So she's struggling a little bit. So legs, Blissy, legs, 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 middle. Good girl. Yes, go. So you can see I'm adding in a little bit of a layer of complexity by asking a different behavior before I reward with a toy. But because she was anticipating the toy, she got stimulated. So she, her brain, you know, is struggling with that. And that's why it's so important to teach this, not while you are in a park with all the stimuli of other dogs chasing tennis balls or the birds flying about or the squirrels running about. You need to start shaping this sort of at home, in your back garden, in your living room, and then building it up into different places. So if anyone has any questions, pop them on just um and we'll have a look if um if any of that sort of makes sense but that's what's important okay so i might have just a, a sort of quick recap in terms of sort of that disengagement so you i use the crate you could use a heavy tub you could use a colander with a brick on it um <laughs> but with the food again i can pop a pile of food there okay 
I can move over here. So hop it up. So the food's over there now. I've got no chance of stopping her from getting that. But what she knows is I've got food here. Uh, hop it up. Bliss, hop it up. <laughs> She's caught a scent of. Bliss, Bliss, hop it up. Thank you. Sit. Good girl. Come here then. Good girl. Come on then, go get it and then let her go get the food. So you can see no real stress, no mither, but it's all just processing that because she's stimulated by something. So you can see how she was sniffing the ground. So whatever it's, whether it's a, a treat that's gone under there or something, something got her interest. And it's about, rather than panicking and sort of start shouting and trying to get her to listen, it's just working through that so she can go, okay, getting that arousal down, good girl. So, have I missed anything? Let me just check my notes. Um, so, what have we done? So we've done sort of thinking and arousal, we've done transferring um, with food, linking the experience. So we're trying to make food an experience as well. So rather than just food being delivered boring, you know, if you think I can, yes, I can deliver food to the hand, but come in then Bliss, if I can make food, Make it more of an event. Ready? So I can do a little bit of food layering, but as you can see, it's got more saliency, more interest. And then the hard part is sort of throwing, bliss. Ah, oh, she got it. <laughs> so I didn't throw it far enough away. So again, I can go, ready? Bliss, Bliss, come here, girl. Good girl. Go get it. Good girl. So it's about getting her to sort of come away while you're making things more interesting. Good girl. Go get it. So one of the other things that we, I kind of like is, is this sort of stop go, where you can kind of start introducing when you start building in the weight command. So the next addition from that would be building in a weight. So if you know that she's waiting, so come here then Bliss. Good girl. Good girl. So if I pop this down, and now because she's waiting, I can actually say, wait. Good girl, okay, get it. But because it's not moving, you can see how she's not so interested in it. But if we move it, she's still not interested in it <laughs> because something you want. Let's try this. <laughs> Good girl. So we'll try with the frisbee. So this is one of the favourites but so now what we want is we can have a bit of tug, create a bit of arousal up. Out. Good girl. So now what we want is, can we get that middle? Ready? Okay, go. Wait. Middle. Go get it. Good girl. Yes, good girl. Whoa. <laughs> Good girl. Out. Good girl, yes. 
Daily out. Good girl. Out. So then what we can do is we can sort of come down this way. I'll go right, bliss, middle. Throw that over there. Can't quite see it, but ready? Three, two, one. Go get it. Wait. Middle. Good girl. Go get it. <laughs> Yay, good girly. Good girl. So you can see now how we're building up a desire in something that she really wants, something that she enjoys, but we can switch her off to it. Out. Yes, good girl. Now, for those of you obviously go, well, you know, she's got an out, she's got this, so how do you teach an out? Um, I never really take toys off my dog, so as you can see, I let her keep it. But because she likes playing tug, if I do this and sort of move over here, you know, she wants to bring the toy and be engaged. Good girl, out. Bliss, out. Out. <laughs> Good girl. She's not used to me doing out without my hand on it. Okay. So, but with an out, what you do is once you've got her in, interested in it and playing tug, good girl. We can play tug. And if this was your dog and they didn't have an out, wouldn't let go, oh, get it. All you would do is you hold it, bring it, you, <laughs> so she's gonna let it go, but you would just basically see if we can get her jazzed up again. Yes, good girl. Good girl, yes. Whoa. Ready? Yes, good girl. You bring it into yourself. Oh, hold it still. As she lets it go, you say out. Good girl. Ready? <laughs> good girl. Jump. Good girl. Ready? Good girl. Yes, good girl. So again, just building value into other items. And again, you can use this. The only problem with doing this in front of, um, dare I say, if your dog's excitable around other dogs, or your dog's reactive to other dogs. Um, anyone that knows knows I don't particularly like that word because all dogs are reactive, they're reaction animals, so they react to stimuli. But you know, if they bark and lunge, um, because they're just unsure, um, playing something like this in front of that dog is probably not the best thing, okay? Depending on the dog, because while Bliss would absolutely stay focused on this, um, play it with the wrong dog, you've just jazzed them right up. Another dog comes into view, they let go of this. The reaction to that other dog is gonna be worse. So the reason why we try and get them onto food, particularly in those situations. Good girl. Is because food is calming. So the two systems at play, so you've got the parasympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system. Um, parasympathetic nervous system is linked to gut and digestion. So if they're taking food, they're much calmer. If they're spitting food out or switching off to it, they're overstimulated. And the only thing you can do at that moment is get them out of there, create distance or at least keep them moving. So, you know, figure of eight walking, taking them away, <laughs> good girl but if they're eating you know this isn't just because I love feeding my dog or whatever I love feeding them in an engaging way which is more interesting for Bliss she would much rather um, I, mean, I think I did a video how many weeks ago where I put a plate of chicken on the floor and scatterfed just kibble around it they didn't touch the chicken on the plate because they'd rather go and sort of search and try and find the food in a much more interesting way. 
Um, so for making the food interesting rather than just delivering it like that, which is why you'll often see me doing things like dropping it from a height, just moving it around. So that it's a more of an event, but it's just an important fact that dog that's eating is calmer. Um, one other little tip with oncoming dogs is to pair the standard thing that a lot of people used to say um, and is a form of counter conditioning and desensitization would be, you know, you see a dog coming in the distance and you would be, you'd stop, you'd come down, you'd get the treat and you'd hold the treat like this and the dog would be getting closer and closer and closer and you're holding this treat and then they're doing really, really well. The dog gets to a certain point and your dog just goes ballistic. And believe it or not, then the treat, remember I said about value transfer, this is the important message with value transfer is it can transfer emotional stuff as well. So all of a sudden now, this holding a treat like this becomes a predictor of that dog getting closer. So now this becomes aversive. It becomes punishing for the dog. And actually they may not even, they may look at it, but they just know that something bad's coming. <laughs> Does that make sense? So now it's like dog approach, dog approach, dog approach, dog approach, explode. While you're holding the treat here, they're gonna pair this with the dog approaching. So tr the value transfer happens both ways. So you've gotta be really careful with that fine tuning. So for me, as soon as I notice that, say Bliss sees a dog 100 feet over there, so the minute she clocks it and just looks and looks back to me, she gets one. When that dog gets closer, she'll get two. As the dog gets closer, she'll get three. And when the dog's really close, she'll get four. So what's happening there is the value transfer is, oh, dog gets closer, I get more. Now that could be that I increase the saliency. So the value of the item. So rather than it being one treat, two treats, three treats, four treats, it could be um, good girl one treat, chicken, smoked sausage, okay? So I could increase the saliency as the dog gets closer. So she gets more or higher value for the dog getting closer. So if she is more feeling slightly worried, her brain can go, mm, yeah, I'm slightly concerned, but there's a lot of good things. So we're now transferring good things happening, okay? So holding the dog and expecting them to wait is really tough because a still dog with a stimulus approaching the stress hormone will increase. So they'll become more stressed. Whereas if you can interrupt and get them to sort of look at the dog, look away, take a piece of food, the dog's naturally got close. So when they look again, get them to look away, treat, you're breaking it down. It's becoming much easier for them to cope rather than just, I mean, dare I say it, let's use um, a terrible example. I mean, I don't know. You see um, a car swerving down the road, you know, while you're sort of at a crossing, you kind of think, Oh, what's happening as that car's getting closer your heart rate starts pumping up so if you just sort of stay there and stay staring at the car that will keep going up but if you were to move off and go behind bollards and behind a brick wall your heart rate will come down because you've taken action to mitigate that stress um, probably not the best example but I hope that, <laughs> that follows suit okay so let's have a quick check I hope you're all still with me so um, anyone got any questions, anyone got anything they would like to add or anything they want me to go back over? Um, if you have, just let me know and I will, um, anything that didn't make any sense, let me just scan back, make sure I've not missed any, any comments. So again, please just let me know if that's made sense for everybody. So that's a little bit of how we transfer value, a little bit of how we talk about, um, disengagement. And you can see there we've got young Blissey going back onto the boundary. Good girl. It's one of the reasons why I love doing something like that on a raised bed is because it, it sort of sit, sinks to the floor and you can just throw your food, although that one has gone off. So she'll go and find that. So yeah, so if you have got any questions, you can still pop them um, in the comments. I'll keep an eye on that. I will be popping this up into um, the YouTube channel. 
so it will be available for you to go in and sort of just re-watch if it didn't make any sense if you want a more in-depth delve into disengagement and really honing that as a skill we do have the disengagement course so it's only 12 pounds so it's um you know a really nice one it's one it's one of the things i love teaching dogs because it's just so powerful in so many situations so not just for the park but for at the home um, visitors arriving all kinds of things going off so i think yeah I've managed to go through that pretty much on time so i'm quite impressed with myself there um just wait to see if there's any questions that pop up did well girl bring it go on then bring it There's a treat just under the boundary, so cool. Right, I shall let you all get on with your, your afternoon. It's still quite nice and warm, so I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it useful. Um, again, pop any questions, let me know, and we'll go from there. Good girl. Well done, Blissy. I'll speak to you soon.